Good morning. How's everybody doing? I appreciate that in my mind at least you say louder things to me than you did for Matt, so thank you. Um, I was going to start this morning with a funny story just so Laura could laugh, but then we have a lot. There it is. Thank you. We've got a lot going on. So uh, we're going to look at the beginning of John's gospel this morning. Primarily we'll be in John chapter 4. There's a story of Jesus. He meets this woman, and he tells her who he really is, which is huge because he hadn't told the, the public yet who he really is. So we're going to look at that and, and really focus on her response to that information that he gives her. But I also want to look at another story that happens just before that of another conversation Jesus has, but he gets a very different response. As we work through this today, the question that I'm asking myself that, that I want you to ask yourself and I want us all to ask each other is, what's your response when you come in these doors, I want you to know that the songs that are prepared and the music is, is prayed over. We, we know that God will work through that music to uh, receive praise, but also to equip us and encourage us to go. I want you to know that, that when, when Brad or I or anyone else gets up here and speaks, the, the message, the scripture, the words are prayed over heavily, trusting that God will use it to help you know him more and help you respond to him as you go out from this building. There's a, a couple verses in Romans chapter 10 that Paul wrote. He says, how then can they call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they're sent? I'm sent to preach, to use my words, my life, to share the good news about Jesus, but so are all of you. When this verse talks about a preacher, they don't just mean someone with a title, someone with stands up on stage in front of people and drones on and on for 30 to 40 minutes each week. That's each one of us are called and equipped to go out and preach, to tell the good news to the world around us. You are being sent out to tell everyone about Jesus. So what will you do? How will you respond? What's your next step? Because they can't hear the message if you aren't telling them. And if they don't hear, how can they respond to him and know? We're going to get going again, like Matt said, we're going to be primarily in John chapter 4 today, if you want to go ahead and open up to that. Let me set the scene, though. Something is about to happen. When we look at the beginning of the New Testament, uh, we've got the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they tell the same story from different vantage points, different perspectives, but the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those are known as the synoptic Gospels because they're so similar. You can line them up pretty parallel, and they tell the same stories, a lot of the same phrases, a lot of the same words are there. They were all eyewitnesses to that, but John... John kind of beats to his own drum a little bit. His, his version of Jesus' life, his version of Jesus' story, it's the same story, but he tells it a little differently. A, a different audience from a different perspective with different points stressed. John's gospel opens up with some remarks about Jesus being the word and, and being always existing as God. Next, we're introduced in John's gospel to John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, and a couple of, of guys who are following him, learning about the Messiah. They, they run into Jesus, John the Baptist and his followers run into Jesus, and now John's followers follow Jesus, which sounds like, why would Jesus steal his cousin's followers? But that was the whole plan. John didn't want to gather followers. He's pointing people to Jesus, just like we are pointing people to Jesus. And this is where we see Jesus beginning to gather those disciples, those guys who are going to spend the next three years uh, with him, following him hearing him, seeing the things that he's doing. And these are the guys who are going to go out and be his witnesses in the world and ultimately get the church started. And that gets down to us, right, where we're sitting here as a church family in this building. Then Jesus turns water into wine at a wedding celebration. He heads on down to Jerusalem, and he, he kicks some people out of the temple who were taking advantage of people, making a profit by twisting God's laws around for their own benefit. And then after that, Jesus goes out in the country, and people come follow him, and they're being baptized, which brings us to our passage for today. If you want to open up John chapter 4, we're going to start with just the first uh, six verses there. When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. He had to travel through Samaria, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the property that Jacob had given his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. <clears throat> Jesus is tired, right? Obviously, we don't have in the Gospels the account of every minute detail of everything Jesus did, of everything he said. This is just an overview of his life with highlights from those eyewitnesses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, of what Jesus is doing, but he is moving around a lot on foot. In fact, uh, in the first, um, just the first uh, three chapters of John here, Jesus has covered more than 260 miles on foot. 
Now, he had some breaks in there. He didn't just walk 260 miles straight. He had a nice wedding celebration to relax with. He stopped here and there and went to different towns. But that's a lot of walking, right? Have you ever walked 260 miles that you know of? Like maybe in your lifetime, some of us who are really old, that's a long way. But So Jesus gets to this well, and he sits down, and he sends the disciples, like, go, go into town, find a Subway or Taco Bell or something, and bring something back so we can have a meal. But there's this really cool bit here that uh, Jesus is sitting at Jacob's well, um, this historical well that Jacob dug, like Jacob, the son of uh, Isaac, the son of Abraham. Uh, the cool thing, though, is that Jacob dug this well, and he's in Jesus' lineage. When we look in Matthew chapter 1 and we see all those names and that he begat him and he begat him and he begat him that we skip over because the names are weird and it's tedious. Well, when we look through that, uh, there are a lot of greats here, but Jacob is Jesus' great, 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 36 greats grandfather. 38 generations of Jacob's family have come to this well, just like Jesus is sitting here now, resting and waiting. Something is about to happen. Let's read on, verse uh, 7 and on a little bit. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to get food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket. And the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. The Samaritan woman, she comes to get some water from the well at noon. Maybe you've heard the significance of the time of day and Jesus talking to this Samaritan woman, but humor me because I'm going to tell you about it all over again. Normally, Jews would go out of their way even to avoid this region of Samaria, right? They wouldn't go through there. They'd go around it because they despised the Samaritans. Way back down the family tree, there was this disagreement. The Samaritans were from the lineage of Joseph, um, like Joseph of the Technicolor Dreamcoat, uh, who was sold into slavery by his 10 older brothers and basically ended up running all of Egypt second in command only to Pharaoh during that drought. He told Pharaoh's dream and all that. So that's the lineage they're coming from. When the kingdom of Israel was divided then after Solomon died, the southern kingdom known as Judah, they set up Jerusalem as their capital, and that's where the temple was built. The northern kingdom, called Israel, eventually established their capital in a city called Samaria, a name that now encompassed the entire region there. There are a lot of references throughout the Old Testament. You can see some more reasons why the Jews didn't like the Samaritans, why the Samaritans didn't like the Jews. That would be a great Sunday afternoon project for you to just go read most of the Old Testament and look into that and understand better. Um, But the point here today is that the Jews and the Samaritans did not get along to each other, with each other. Jews, especially a Jewish man, wouldn't associate with Samaritans, especially a Samaritan woman. Also, this lady is at the well at noon. That's not the normal time you would go and get water. It's hot at noon, right? So in the middle of the day, you would come earlier in the day to get your water. When it's cooler, that's when everyone's there. It's kind of the social time. You can talk to your friends, catch up on what happened with their day the day before. But this woman came at noon by herself. She's got some complications, some relationship issues in her life, and she wasn't really very accepted by the rest of her people. Coming alone in the heat of the day and working harder physically was easier for her. It was simpler. It's less hurtful. She shows up to get her water for the day, and and Jesus is there, and he asks her for a drink when she begins to draw the water up for herself. He starts to introduce himself here by talking about living water. He says, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd be asking me for water. When you come into God's presence, do you come to him as if you're coming before the creator of all things? Or do you approach him kind of like the woman at the well did? What would your response be in this situation? This woman was very practical, right? He didn't even have a bucket to get water. The well is deep. This living water that he's talking about with no bucket, how is he going to get it? She's skeptical, right? Jews don't associate with Samaritans, so what's his angle? What's his deal? She's kind of blowing him off and dismissing him a little bit at first as if he were kind of crazy. Seriously, why was he even here right now? Is this one of those kind of hidden camera situations? Did someone put a camera in the well and it's going to pop up and gotcha type situation? But I think we do the same thing sometimes. We, we approach God with this, this edge of, of what we'll call realism or, or practicality. Like, we, we don't all the way believe that he can do all the things, right? He, he can, but maybe, maybe not all the way. Maybe we trust him a little bit, but, like, really all the things? Can, can Jesus really do all the things? 
I think we tend to approach with kind of a, a genie in the bottle type situation where we, we rub the lamp and just get our wishes granted and then put them back in on the shelf until we need them again later. The woman asked him, you aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Well, let's look at Jesus' response, reading on from verse 13. Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You've correctly said I don't have a husband, Jesus said, for you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. All right, things are heating up, right? Jesus kind of calls her out on that husband situation. That's a really good first conversation with a stranger thing to do, right? She's been married five times and is now living with a man who isn't her husband. Culturally, that was completely unacceptable, and that was a huge part of why she was at the well alone at noon. There's even talk in another place of Scripture of stoning a woman for the same adulterous offense, right? This is, this is a serious thing that he's calling her out on, a serious thing for which she's ostracized from her community. But the fact that he knew these things about her caused her to say, I see that you are a prophet. There's something about him, and she sees it, but she doesn't quite know or understand what it is. A big issue that she would have had with Jews, likely the same issue other Samaritans would have had, was that the Jews insisted that the temple in Jerusalem was the only right place to worship God. Samaritans weren't allowed in the temple courts because the Jews thought the Samaritans were icky, stupid heads. So you can see why the Samaritans had this kind of pickle if they can't go in the temple, but the temple's the only place they can worship. What are they supposed to do? Well, rightfully so, they're upset with the Jews because they're prohibiting them from worshiping the God of their ancestors. But an hour is coming and is now here, Jesus said, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. That specifically located worship that the Jews held tight to in Jerusalem, confined to that one place, that wasn't God's plan. That wasn't what God intended to be the long-term solution. Jesus and this lady are having a pretty serious conversation, right? He knows stuff, not just stuff, but he knows all the stuff. Then he tells her that worship is not just for a certain building. Worship is not just for a certain city. Worship is not meant for just one specific mountain. But the way he said these things to her, she wasn't offended. She wasn't upset. She didn't question it at all. She just knew as the words came out of his mouth that he was speaking the truth, that he was speaking with authority. She liked the idea of being welcomed. She liked the idea of being able to worship God in the way that this Jesus was talking about. Reading on, verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Let's stop there for a second. This lady is just trying to get some water. Every day, same time of day, taking care of her basic needs at a time of day when she won't be judged, when she won't be ridiculed, at a time when she can do this in peace. And this dude sitting there at the well a Jew, no less. And not only did he speak to her, this guy she had never met before knew everything about her. And now he just said, I'm the Messiah. What do you even do with that information? How do you respond when Jesus says, I am the Messiah? What's your next step? Reading on verse 27, just then the disciples arrived and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then the woman left her water jar went into town and told the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They left town and made their way to him. 
Jesus just told this lady all about her past. In her own words, he told me everything I ever did. The townspeople, when she goes and tells them this, they know the things that she's done. She's done a lot of things, and they're aware of those. And this stranger from out of town came and told her, could this be the Messiah? Jesus had just outlined this part of her life that had made her ashamed. Yet he wasn't judgy. He dropped this truth bomb on her that he is the Messiah. And it's right there, right there at the well that she understands that it sinks in for her to the deepest part of her being, and she believes him. His words push past those feelings of shame, those feelings that she had been made to feel that she wasn't good enough anymore. And she knows that he is exactly who he just told her that he is. She knows that Jesus is the Messiah. This man sitting across from her was there when Jacob dug that well. This man talking to her had existed always. He is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. This Jesus is salvation. And not only that, he was there for her. But before she could react, the disciples come back. Suddenly, this lady then drops her water jar, and she goes streaking back to town, running as fast as she can to tell all of them what happened and who she had been talking to. And she was so convinced, convincing to the townspeople, did you see what happened? They, the townsfolk, left town and made their way to him. She heard the truth, she believed the truth, and she told the truth to everyone so they could come and hear as well. And now loads of people are coming from town to hear this, from the woman that they avoided, from the woman who was a sinner, from the woman they had ridiculed. And yet Jesus chose that woman to be his herald. He chose that woman to be his messenger to that town. Something is about to happen. I want to jump back for a minute into that other conversation Jesus has a little bit before this. Uh, but first, uh, I have a video I want you to check out that really helped me visualize what happens here with Jesus and this woman. Check this out. Do you believe what I'm telling you? <laughs> Until the Messiah comes and explains everything and sort this mess out, including me. I don't trust in anyone. You're wrong when you say that you've never received anything from God. This Messiah you speak of, I am he. The first one was named Ramin. You were a woman of purity who was excited to be married, <laughs> but he wasn't a good man. He hurt you, and it made you question marriage and even the practice of your faith. Stop it. The second was Farzad. On your wedding night, his skin smelled like oranges. And to this day, every time you pass by the oranges in the market, you feel guilty for leaving him because he was the only truly godly man you've been with. But you felt unworthy. Why are you doing this? I have not revealed myself to the public as the Messiah. You are the first. It would be good if you believed me. You picked the wrong person. I came to Samaria just to meet you. <laughs> Do you think it's an accident that I'm, I'm here in the middle of the day? I am rejected by others. I know, but not by the Messiah. And you know these things because you are the Christ. I'm going to tell everyone. <laughs> I was counting on it. <laughs> Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. It won't be all about mountains or temples. Soon, just the heart. <laughs> you promise? I promise. This man will be everything I've done. Oh, he must be the Christ. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
You may love the Chosen series, you may hate the Chosen series, but one thing the Chosen series is doing is what we're talking about today. It's helping people hear the message so they can believe the message, so they can tell the message. It's doing what we're called to do, to let people who feel rejected, like they're the wrong person, know that they're not rejected by the Messiah. If this woman who's an outcast can respond to the way that she did and have such an effect on her community, it it seems reasonable that what could God do then if someone has no influence and and is an outcast from town? What if we get someone who's influential? What if we get someone who has a, a voice in the community, someone who's educated and knows more? Well, interestingly, when you look back a chapter, it it doesn't matter at all. Jesus had a conversation with with Nicodemus. He was one of the the leading Pharisees. When God calls, you follow and you do, and something happens. So Nicodemus came to Jesus asking questions, seeking answers. Nicodemus acknowledged that Jesus was from God. In John 3, 2, Rabbi, we know that you were a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. But the difference between the two is their response. The woman, the woman then left her water jar, went into town and told the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? She dropped everything she was doing. Getting water for the day was an important part of her day, but now she met the Messiah and the water doesn't matter. She understood what he meant by living water. She dropped everything and ran to town to tell them all. But Nicodemus, his response was, how can these things be true? Nicodemus couldn't see past what he thought he knew. Nicodemus couldn't accept the fact that Jesus was there for him. He couldn't see past all the rules and regulations. He couldn't see beyond maintaining the status quo. Nicodemus couldn't wouldn't take that next step. So what do we do with this information? How do we respond? What's your next step? Let's read on and see what happens, but I want to skip a small section we'll come back to later and and jump down to verse 39. Now many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of what he said, and they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, since we've heard for ourselves and know that this really is the Savior of the world. This woman believed and responded by going to tell her entire community about the man that she met who told her in her own words everything I'd ever done. She heard, she believed, and she told John's gospel tells us that many more believed because of her testimony, because she told them what she had experienced, and now they came to him as well, and their faith was strengthened because of what they heard and what they experienced. And if you take this on and on, they hear, they believe, and they tell because of what they experienced, and then they tell the people who then hear and believe and go tell someone else. And that's why we're here now. That's why we're here now. I shared the verse from Romans earlier. How then can they call on him whom they have not believed? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? That's you. And how can they preach unless they're sent? What do you do with that? What is your response? What's your next step? Because something Something is happening. I'm going to go back and and read those verses I skipped over. Uh, Verse 31 is where we're going to be at. In the meantime, remember, this is the disciples came back. She ran off telling her town that, that he was the Messiah. The disciples kept urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. The disciples said to one another, could someone have brought him something to eat? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, Jesus told them. Don't you say there are still four more months and then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. The reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper can rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you didn't labor for and others have labored and you have benefited from their labor. I've been asking what your response will be 
all morning. And, and the Holy Spirit is moving in, in our church family, in our world. Something is happening. Jesus gives you your answer right here in this passage. What's your response? Jesus says, open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for a harvest. The harvest is ready. And Jesus isn't talking about wheat or corn or beans like we drive around all the time here in Illinois. Jesus said it himself. He's talking about people. I switched this part to the end because the end of the sermon is called the decision time, right? And this is where you have to make a decision of what you're going to do with the information you just heard, the information you just received. What's your response? What's your next step? What will you do now? Because something is happening and you have the opportunity to be a part of what God is going to do. You can be like Nicodemus, just kind of maintain what you have and not be able to see past what you think you know not accepting that Jesus is here for you, not accepting that Jesus chose you, not being willing to see beyond the rules and regulations and the status quo. Or you can be like this woman that Jesus met at the well. You can drop everything you're doing and run, don't walk to tell the world about him. Will you pray with me? God, thank you so much for all that you've done Thank you that we have this story of, of just this one situation, this one woman that you talked to, and how her life was changed when she heard about you, when she believed about you, and when she went and told others, and their lives were changed as well. And I pray you let us take this story to heart. God, help us to be willing to go, to be a part of what you're doing. Help us to hear, help us to believe, and help us to go and share that good news. Thank you so much for Jesus, and it's in his name I pray. Amen.